Hi, I'm Vince from Spirit of the West. Thanks for watching Cahoots Live. So how did you end up in Spirit of the West? Well, um, I moved to uh, Vancouver a really long time ago, in the mid-80s, uh, just to become, I mean, I was already a professional drummer, but I wanted to move away from the, the hinterlands and come to where the action was. And I was just yeah. a kid. And I just got locked up with all these guys who were, I don't know how I fell into the crowd, but these superb musicians like Pat Stewart and Doug Elliott and Craig Northey. And uh, I just ended up being one of the busiest guys in town on drums because I was, you know, one of about three, four, five guys who could kind of do everything anytime, anywhere. And, you know, it's comedy. Okay, now it's heavy metal. And, oh, it's jazz. Whatever. Just give me the gig. Okay, um, so so give me the gig. Speaking of that, what is something that stands out to you as one of your more memorable gigs? Oh boy, there's a lot of very with with Spirit of the West. There were a lot of tremendous gigs. I mean, we we did several tours with the Tragically Hip. One of them, I think, the biggest show we've ever done was at Molson Park in Barrie, Canada wow. Day, mm -hmm. which uh, was. I think there were 55 or 60,000 people there. Wow. That's a big crowd, no matter how you slice it. Do you still get kind of like butterflies if you're playing for those big crowds? No, no, yeah. no butterflies, but definitely you, you, you're up. Your energy is way up and you look forward to it because it's the best yeah. thing ever, right? I mean, can you imagine yeah. getting paid to do that? No kidding. Actually, that, that was another question I had for you. Like, I, I, I'm a musician also, but I, I've always kind of toured around and just did like little kind of bar gigs and just kind of one man right. band kind of deal. Um, does music ever feel like a job to you? No. Never? No, no. Never no, has? It, it, no, I, I made a commitment to myself when I was probably five or six years old, which was it's, if it ever becomes boring, I'm done. Yeah. So I force it. I force it. I, I, some very wise old musicians said there's a corner of beauty in every single song, even the worst song, even achy, breaky pancreas. There's a corner of beauty. You set up camp there and you maneuver forth from that position of beauty. That's the only way you can survive through those shitty gigs. Because yeah. you're doing something that is absolutely gorgeous. You yeah. know, music is all about unity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Who's hey, this? This is Oliver. Hey Oliver, you're on yeah. the you're on the screen. Say hi. <laughs> All right. That being said, so it never feels like a job. Do you ever get no. sick of your own songs, where you just want to retire retire some of them? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's how. You, that's one of the techniques you would use for uh, uh, for keeping it fresh is to make sure that you're cycling through. I mean, when you Spirit of the West has. I mean, we don't play anymore, but we had nearly 300 songs yeah so you're forced to do some of the uh the more, more beloved songs for the people because if you don't play home for a rest at the end of the night they're going to go people it's just like go nuts for that. Anthem yeah. of creation, for heaven's sakes it's very much yeah. a, a, a touchstone uh, and so we had to do certain songs there were about four or five that we had to do. But then that left little chunks of the set list where we could cycle through the ones that we enjoy playing. You know, Jeff yeah. Kelly was a great one for going, ah, you know, I'm really feeling a hankering to do such and such a song. Let's let's run it in sound check, smooth it down, and we throw it in and we do that. And and also people come to shows multiple times, right? Yeah. We have one lady, she's been to uh, three hundred of our shows. Three hundred. So, you know, That's we have commitment. to think about those people too. You know, we don't yeah. want them set list every single night do you write any of your own material oh yeah i mean yeah. I've, I've yeah yeah i write stuff i've done movie soundtracks i've uh and i'm also a, a writer and author really so, yeah i do that and i i manage and i produce and i mean i'm a canadian musician what does that mean it means i do absolutely everything because if you don't you start that's yeah. how it works and that's why canadians are so valuable internationally you know, you can go down to some specialized city like Los Angeles and, well, we need somebody who understands Pro Tools. Well, that'll be me. <laughs> yeah, but we need somebody that can play Latin music. That'll be me. Yeah, but uh, we need a producer. That'll be me. So we all play. We, we, we're, we're sitting in a music store right now. We mm -hmm. all teach as well. 
Our group here, Cahoots Entertainment, we have a bit of a band. What advice would you give for somebody that's just kind of starting out trying to make it as a band in the music industry in Canada? Oh, I could go on for many, many hours about this, but I would say uh, set your sights very high, but set your expectations very low. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, nobody in the audience has any appreciation of what your vision is at all, and they're not going to for a long time. Yeah. And they're uh, pretty well everybody with or without saying it is going to be thinking, well, they can't do that unless they're such and such a group. And until you become that group who's broken the mold, yeah, you're not allowed to do it in their minds. People right. are extremely hidebound and they don't they don't realize they are. Yeah. And music, music uh, musicians, musicians Hi. see Hi. music. Hi. Musicians see music, they, they, they see with their ears while the audience listens with its eyes. Yeah. So if you look great on stage, they're going to like you. I love you. And you got to sneak in the musicality because yeah. it's all about entertainment first. Entertainment first, the musical quality comes uh, later to the listener. So if you are like me and you've always wanted to be a fabulous player and a really exacting musician, it's going to take you so long to be recognized. Wow. Yeah, you have so to be kinda, so. Just kind of keep grinding, eh? That's re that's really. Well, keep it. grinding and, and don't don't think that uh, your precious creative ideas are going to be uh, appreciated by people who are not cares. Because yeah. you know, it's you know you can make the world's most uh, amazing French fries. People come, they want the regular old French fries. Yeah, they have they an idea fries. about how a thing's supposed to be, and they yeah. And you introduce it slowly over time. Nothing is going to happen overnight. Right. So did you have that uh, moment where you're like, <laughs> that realization, well, now I've made it, you know, that I made no, it moment. I still don't think I've made it, no. no. But I, I definitely had those moments where I looked on stage, I looked at the audience and I went, I'm driving this boat. You know, everybody else thinks they're driving the boat, I'm driving it and I'm happy with not being uh, recognized as the driver, but I know if something goes sideways, I'm in charge here. And yeah. that's a good feeling of confidence in command. And when you can read the room and you know that the audience is flagging slightly in their energy and you kind of call out to one of the guys, come on, let's get it going here. Yeah. Get faster tempo, more energy. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Then, then you're plugged into the energy of the, of the room and the people. And there's that, that, uh, um, uh, emotional feedback loop with the audience, which is tremendously important. Okay, so I've always heard it said there's three things in life that are for sure, death, taxes, and your band are going to break up. And did you guys always work well together or? Uh... Well, well, yeah, I mean, surprisingly, that's why we lasted 35 years. Yeah. But there were difficulties. There were definitely growing pains. And, you know, with us, it's because we were older guys and, and we have families, as you can see, we spawn like salmon. Um, a lot of it was the pull from home, you know, come on, come home. You've been away for weeks and weeks and weeks. I need help with the two babies in diapers, you know? So there was a lot of that and there were some creative differences, but there were never, there were never any creative differences where people just threw up their hands and had hissy fits and went storming out of the studio. That actually never happened. It's an extremely reasonable group of people, but I mean, that kind of stuff happens all the time. Yeah. Would you say it's more about sort of uh, your musical chemistry or more about your personal chemistry when you're working in a band? Oh, it's definitely both. It's all factors. Yeah. And if you're uh, if you're going in there like a bull in a china shop, you can insult people even when you're just trying to get a musical idea across. So keeping your uh, your thumb on the pulse of events as far as others' feelings is very important. Your choice of words, the tone. Uh, explaining what your end goal is so that people don't think you're just trying to hog uh, control of some situation to say, look, we, we really need to change this because of these musical factors for the end result of the song. Can we look at this mm -hmm. and speak to them like you're in a business meeting to, to mm -hmm. an extent, mm -hmm. a highly creative. This is how it's got to be. And I'm a genius. And mm -hmm. This is how Bowie did it. I don't care how Bowie did it. We're yeah. not Bowie. Yeah. No. You kind of have to let the song be the star and let your egos take a back seat to whatever is going to make that yeah. better. Right? On first. Serve. Yeah. The song. And then at the end of that, when you have your 12, 14 songs, 16 songs, you say, we need the best 10. 
Then you look through and you go, well, to serve the little narrative here, this yeah. one, this, this one, this, this great one we love, we got to throw it out of this sequence. We'll keep it for later, maybe. Yeah. Don't, don't just lose it forever. But, you know, you have to think about these things from a couple of levels higher and look down on it and go, how will this serve the package? The, the sound, the trajectory of the band, you should have a five album plan. A five album plan? I that always said, yeah. Every group that I manage or produce, I say, okay, I'm looking at this as album one of five albums. And this huh. is how it's going to progress. And this one has to have this tonality because when I met you, you were sounding like that. That's what I like the most about you. We'll optimize that and we'll add in a couple of little seeds that'll allow us to grow to the next album. So think long term. Okay. So can you sort of, uh, sort of, predict and foresee your your genre and your sound changing because that that happens for a lot of artists over time as they sort of they their 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 sound changes so do you do you kind of factor that in when you're when you're writing it's like maybe maybe i want to do a rock album let's stick this four albums down the road when we do something a little bit more rock and roll or like whatever well, when i'm be. when i'm producing i definitely foresee that kind of stuff because I met I can read these people especially young musicians I read them far far better than they read themselves because I've yeah. been through every dynamic situation every group dynamic situation and every breakup and every temper tantrum and I've seen that I've seen all of it so I know I look at you know guy x and I go he's a good singer he has no idea he's a singer we've got to put a vocal on this album mm -hmm. and then maybe two on the next one if that works and three on the next one and then you know or okay. certain types of instrumentation. We need strings, we need horns, we need an organ, we need real drums, we need fake drums, whatever. Yeah. You add these factors slowly and you build it over time so that people are not radically uh, shocked by a uh, change. Okay. So, so when you're working with Spirit yeah. of the West, when you're, when you're sort of doing the production and the, and, the, and the mixing, is that a very collaborative effort between all you guys? No, we found the, the collaborative mixing was pointless because some of the guys know how to, how to, they understand a sound picture and some yeah. of the guys don't. And some of the guys fixate on frequencies and other guys don't. I found that the wisest thing is to, for us, get a really good producer and give it over to him. Okay. Contribute as a team, as you create, throw it down to tape yeah. and let the, the, let the producer mix. Okay. And then everybody, everybody is, as opposed to one of those kind of real group albums where everybody ends up equally dissatisfied. Yeah. You're a really, really good producer who can mix very well and let him, let him decide which is the instrumental uh, moment in each passage or phrase. Okay. So who are some producers that you would say you, that, that you respect um, that you've worked with? Well, I'll say my very favorite uh, producer in Canada is Michael Philip Voivoda, who we worked with uh, over several albums. What a gifted man. Yeah. Tremendous ears. Very good with, uh, uh, he can tell you tough things in a beautiful, gentle way and make you feel like you're still completely part of the team. He doesn't go, oh, that sucks. Get out of here. Yeah. No, and there's, there's a lot of that. You know? Yeah. Like people who don't have the skills. He can run a room. He's hilarious. He's he's a you know basically he's the same age as me, so I really relate to him well. Right and I'll, I'll put him at the top of the list, and I don't even have to say anybody else because there's lots of great producers. People like Daniel Lanois and Bob Rock. These are tremendous guys, but I have such an, a fondness for Michael. Awesome. Okay, so what was your favorite song to perform with Spirit of the West? You know, a lot of the songs that were the most enjoyable for me as a drummer. Just yeah. didn't, didn't cut it as crowd pleasers. And I learned a long time ago that you just got to play for the crowd. So, you know, we just, we just, gave them, it, it, most of it was uh, simpler. We found that uh, uh, simpler, solider songs were more appreciated by the audience. So anything yeah. where I'm getting into the drumming going, oh, watch me go. <laughs> so you're saying you, you wear many hats, you do lots of things. Um, between like rehearsals, writing, gigs, recording, uh, what is the most satisfying for you? <laughs> I've always, always loved recording. I could, uh, you know, not as much now because I'm in my 50s, but uh, from say age 18 till age 
45, I could have literally lived in a studio very happy, happily, not leave. I could just play and play and play and play and do it. an album every two days, no problem. I just loved it. I just loved the idea of being a, a character player who could, yeah. you know, do different roles. In, and I did tons of studio work. So you literally were being asked to be a different drummer on each song. And to me, that was one of the great uh, exercises of flexibility and creativity was to be forced to do other things that are not normally part of your, your lexicon. Um, okay, so is it hard finding a balance for you between work and family, especially uh, you, you must be, you tour around everywhere. We did. We, we were busy. We were spent a lot of time in Europe at one point and across Canada umpteen dozen times. But I think that uh, ultimately we didn't succeed as well as we should have because we, we defaulted towards the family, you know, and I really... I, it bothered me to a certain extent that uh, we didn't really knock it out of the park, but what would be the point of having, you know, Grammys and millions of dollars if you had this this line of ex-wives in your wake? Mm -hmm. I, I don't see the point of that. I have, you know, I have a beautiful family and we've held together through all these decades and that's kind of the best balance point for me is to have all of the family and all of the spirit families are very close. We're one big yeah. unit and we're, we're attached at the hip and we're very worried about others, kids and everybody's situations. Yeah. And, and we're particularly worried about John right now because of his Alzheimer's disease. Right. You guys are all spread out across the country. Do you make a point of getting, getting together every so often? Yeah. A couple of times a year. Right on. A couple of times a year, we uh, we have an annual barbecue. It used to be here at my house, and now it's migrated down to Victoria to Tobin's house. Okay. But it's a Vancouver Island summer barbecue, and it's oh boy, cool. Lock up your liquor. All right, man. I think I only have one more question for you. What is your favorite album? Oh. Uh, I love uh, What do you think my favorite album is? <laughs> I would say that, generally speaking, my favorite all-round al album is Songs for Singing Lovers by Frank Sinatra. Yeah? Cool. I love Frank Sinatra, too. Hi, I'm Vince Dittrich from Spirit of the West. I'm here with Oliver Dittrich, not from Spirit of the West. I'm hoping to be in Spirit of the West someday. <laughs>